Greetings, this is Daniel Kramer for Trailers from Hell, and uh, today we're going to be getting into something sweet. Something that not only tastes good, but sounds good, too. It's the Strawberry Statement from 1970, one of the real touchstones of counterculture cinema of the, uh, uh, of the late 60s and of the American cinema of that time as well. Uh, and it's my personal favorite in the wave of campus protest and campus revolt pictures of that time. Uh, other films in that, in that school, if you will, included uh, Richard Rush's Getting Straight, Stanley Kramer's RPM, Antonioni's Zabriskie Point, Jack Nicholson's Drive, He Said, Paul Williams's The Revolutionary, to some degree Theodore J. Flicker's uh, uh, Up in the Cellar, and a number of others. Uh, this one also won the Cannes Film Festival Jury Prize and uh, has a pretty fantastic soundtrack. Uh, and uh, it won the, the, con, the con prize in what was a pretty formative and formidable year for cinema. So from 1970, let's take a bite out of Stuart Hagman's The Strawberry Statement. The Con Film Festival jury that year included Kirk Douglas, Carol Rice, and Volker Schlondorf with the Palme d'Or going to Altman's MASH. Other prizes were given out to Investigation of a Citizen Above Suspicion and Leo the Last. So here we have Bruce Davison right on the heels of his role in the Perry's Masterpiece last summer, and he's in San Francisco. Hey, that's where I live. And with the lovely Kim Darby, no less. I do love the way this film captures my city. The book upon which it's based by James Coonan is set at Columbia University, and the film was originally slated to be shot there. But Columbia withdrew their offer and the project decamped to the Bay Area. In my opinion, it was a good move. They hired playwright Israel Horowitz to adapt Kunin's book. That's Beastie Boy Adam Horowitz's dad. And he makes a cameo as a crafty crawly professor in one scene. The studio here is MGM. And that means that the strawberry statement was one in a string of counterculture pictures greenlit by smiling cobra James Aubrey. It was released alongside a slate of other counterculture-themed movies, including The Magic Garden of Stanley Sweetheart, Brewster McLeod, Alex in Wonderland, Zabriskie Point, and The Sidelong Glances of a Pigeon Kicker. Aubrey canceled big, top-heavy, old-fashioned productions like Fred Zinneman's Man's Fate and Blake Edwards' Say It With Music in favor of projects like this one, which were seemingly more in sync with the changing times. Zinneman and Edwards, however, cursed Aubrey to their dying breaths, and they weren't the only ones. The director of this film, Stuart Hagman, would follow up the strawberry statement with a little scene and seldom remembered drug-themed drama called Believe in Me, which was recut by the powers that be, Aubrey being the most consequential. There was a lot of that type of thing going on at MGM between 1969 and about 1974. This film owes a debt of gratitude to the cutting and overall style of Richard Lester, Little surprise, as he was a stylistic nexus for a lot of the goings-on in popular cinema. Also featured in the cast, Bob Balaban, Jeannie Berlin, Bud Court, who was a year off from Harold and Maude, David Dukes, and Michael Margotta. These were all early rules for them. These days, people seem to remember the soundtrack to this film more than the film itself. I mean, after all, there was Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Neil Young doing Helpless Solo, there was Our House, there was Buffy St. Marie, and The Circle Game. A lot of classic 60s tunes are on this soundtrack. But I just read that it inspired Japanese filmmaker Chisuke Kaneko to become a filmmaker, so it's got its devotees. I'll gladly sign my name to that list as well. About six or seven years ago, when I composed a list of the lesser-known films that I felt used San Francisco the best as a shooting location, the Strawberry Statement topped my list. And I have to say, though certain aspects of it have dated, it still has a surprisingly fresh vitality and ingenuity I've long admired. And when I say long admired, I first saw it on VHS when I was about 12 years old, and I'm now in my late 30s. I often feel I was born at a time. Strange predicament. And tearful at the ball.